Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and this is the Right to Read initiative where we speak to educators about best practices in teaching children how to read. Today, I have Dr. Matthew Kirstead from Alberta, and we are going to talk about his journey to the science of reading. Good day, Dr. Kirstead. Why don't you let listeners know a little bit about who you are and where you are in your career currently? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, uh, currently I am a K-6 principal um, in Alberta. Um, just recently in 2020, I completed my doctorate um, in system change and uh, professional development to improve early literacy practices of teachers. Um, I've been at my current school, I think for about eight years now. Uh, and I think it's my fourth school, fourth or fifth school that I've been in. I've been principal at all grades, K to 12. Um, and currently at the school that I'm at, we're actually wrapping up our reading project uh, that we had. You know, most elementary schools have literacy as a goal for their schools. And uh, we did too. We started that about five or six years ago. And now we're wrapping it up because of the, we no longer need to focus on it, have it as a goal as it's been an acculturated thing in our school. That's wonderful, um, especially when you look at how many students you're having an impact on when it's not being the focus and it's just established uh, and your teachers are, are ready to run with other projects uh, to help make things better for everyone. So why don't we start at the beginning looking at, you know, why you got into teaching in the first place? Yeah, I did, I did not take a direct route to where I'm at. Uh, it wasn't the typical route, I don't think. I started about 30 years ago as uh, an industrial arts teacher, a junior high, senior high industrial arts teacher. It's uh, something that spoke to me about engaging kids in schools. And I know from my own experience going through school that industrial arts was one of those things that motiv motivated me to come to school and, and uh, and participate. It was something I looked forward to. And so I thought I would do that as well. But as uh, the fates would have it, as we moved along, uh, I was in a school that one September didn't have a vice principal or principal. And uh, so me and another colleague uh, just took the reins and we started putting the school together for all those things that have to happen in September. And the superintendent uh, at, at that time asked us if we would just like to continue, keep going. So he lasted for, he was a principal for a year and then he left in the following year. I jumped into the principalship after that. And uh, and then it takes us to here. I've been now a principal for over 25 years, um, as I mentioned before, at all grade levels. But my, my heart's with the young kids, uh, K to three for sure, K to six currently. Wonderful. So how did you get to this focus on literacy from industrial arts? Absolutely. So in my first posting, so uh, where I sort of, I was rather young to be a principal. And so I, I did it for that while and then, uh, understood that I didn't understand enough about the job. So I left uh, to go back to school for a year uh, to get a master's in educational leadership. But as I would have it, I got married and started having kids, so I didn't finish it. But I ended up in a uh, K-4 to school serving a trailer park community, a low SES community. And it was just a small school, 100 and some kids in it. And the staff was absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, they brought the uh, I was by far the most junior on the staff and, uh, of all these uh, ladies. And they, they brought me into the importance of teaching all kids to learn, especially our lowest performing kids, about the importance around the multi-generational effect that we can have on kids when we teach them to learn and we start them off right. And that we can teach anybody to learn. If we could teach the kids that we were serving uh, in that community to learn uh, with, there's a lot of special needs, as I mentioned, low SES and stuff like that, we, you, we could do it anywhere. Now, because we're now into uh, the late 90s, 
um, and me not knowing enough, we became a Fountas and Pinnell school. Absolutely. We, we did balanced literacy, reading recovery, and all of those things. We were leveling books off because, my gosh, in education, it was the thing to do at that time. And I didn't, I didn't know any better. So we, uh, went, we went through that um, and became, we were one of the first adopters in Alberta to take on, uh, on uh, that system of reading. Um, and so I went through that school and then the next school I went, I carried that with me, but that's when I started getting into data to understand so we could have a better understanding of what, who our kids were and what they wanted. And I moved to an, another key to four school. It was uh, a rural school. And after a few years working data and bringing in again, the balance literacy found, I was noticing that the lowest 20, 25% of our kids were not being served. They were still they weren't making the gains the other kids were. The uh, achievement gap was widening on them and uh, something was going wrong. And it wasn't because, you know, we had fantastic teachers doing the things that fantastic teachers would do. And, and as I mentioned in Alberta, I mean, balanced literacy, it was enculturated. I mean, it's still enculturated in, in a lot of areas without seeing it. But the data was starting to tell us that perhaps it wasn't being as effective as we, as we want it to be, uh, even though our, our fidelity was good and, and things like that. So that's when I started looking around uh, to see, you know, what what other models of, of teaching early literacy are there? And uh, uh, I went back to school. I did get my uh, master's in curriculum development at that time, and uh, understanding that this whole area of science of reading. Now, some people refer to science of reading program. For me, it is not a program. It's just a way of looking at literacy and informing your practice where science has something to say, researchers have something to say about uh, literacy acquisition for children, and that it's up to us to take that and make sense of it in a pedagogical and content knowledge kind of way in the classrooms. And so the um, as I was getting going on that, I got transferred to yet the school, well, the school that I'm at now, where they were just introducing the early years into a school. There was a great configuration in the community. And uh, so a fresh start uh, with teachers sort of from all different schools came together to fill that. And so we began just like, you know, most schools would, we uh, started doing um, uh, PD, group PD on things was very popular. So we're doing group PD and I brought in data right away. To, so it's sort of as the fuel to the engine of the car for change, look what's happening. Here's year one, here's year two and what's happening. And I also at that time, because I was looking for some information, I had uh, seen uh, some work being done in Edmonton at that time by a Dr. George Giorgio. And so just one day I went to the university because of, I needed, was looking for some guidance and I just cold, cold called them and I said, this is what we're doing. We're not far from you. You think we, you could come in and do some speech. So I had George come in and uh, do some work with my student, with my teachers and that. And then we started re resourcing our school, getting sort of doing away from the the vast testing, the benchmark assessment testing, understanding that no, you know, those levels really don't tell us anything about our kids. And no, we don't need to have our books in our library leveled. And as a matter of fact, we're probably going to move and get some decodables to support the, the work that we're doing in early grades and things like that. And then just through instructional leadership in the school, we drifted away from all group, whole groups uh, stuff in the at staff meetings and PD days, because all teachers aren't on the same page. And we started to focus in on what individual teachers uh, were looking at and holding those professional conversations about, uh, here's what your data is saying. And, and I'd hold data meetings with my teachers all the time about, about how their kids are performing um, and saying, where is it that you can improve and do a better job at school? And, and, it's, not a, and it's not a fast process. It does, those things don't happen overnight, it's over time. And, now in, in the school, there's a, there's a real sense of, of self-developed professional development, not waiting for people to come and offer you something or not waiting for people to but understanding that in their own practice, there's areas that they can improve. And this is what the evidence says that we should do. And our focus is, it's on the whole class for sure, but also on our, uh, a lot of it on our lowest performing kids. Um, we also changed in our school some real structural things. So we implemented um, uh, 
well, I'll give you an example for this year because we because of COVID and we've had our, a real critical time for kids entering schools grade one and a lot of our kids weren't in school grade one so they lost a lot of that phonemic development and things that we do at, in kindergarten and into grade one and the data told us that we were very far behind where we normally would have been and so we were able to bring in uh, three full-time learning support teachers who would just do reading interventions with kids. So up to in the first term, we only have two terms, but in the first terms, we concentrated on grades two and three. And then in the, in the second term after grade ones, it had a bit of instruction in the school. We, we did the interventions with the kids in grade one. Um, do fantastic. Again, our data supports the work that we did through the classroom and those supports. Um, I'm happy to say that our grade ones this year are now on par, maybe even a little bit ahead of where they would have been in previous years. And our two, uh, our grades two and three have made significant gains as well. But was the best part of the gains that I like the most is that we brought the bottom up. Uh, uh, that. And our school traditionally does well. In, in Alberta, we have what are known as the preferential achievement tests. And because of the work that we've done in the school, and the, uh, well, mostly the teachers are doing in the school, is that well, we have our goal is to have 95% of our kids at uh, the acceptable level. And we've met that for the last probably four years. And we also border on or exceed having over 50% uh, of our kids at the standard of excellence in reading. So the work, the, what we've done, the systems that we've put in place have shown uh, fantastic results for us. Um, we've also, some of the materials, so we're very well resourced on um, things like decodable readers. We, we do have been using Hagerty for a while. We're just updating to their 2022 in the lower grades, uh, just supporting that instruction. Uh, we've, we've spent a considerable amount of money on uh, non-fiction er, early readers for our kids. Um, and also a lot of them. Uh, you, you just now we've just identified, we've just purchased from uh, two different uh, publishers, a lot of indigenous books as well to support that part of it as well, but are at our children's uh, reading level. It's just a lot of literacy. But the most important thing is that we have the teachers who understand uh, what science is telling us about the, lead, uh, the reading process, but more importantly, what science is telling us to how we can intervene with our struggling readers. Because that's where we need to do most of the work. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay if your dog wants to join. Um, there are so many amazing things that you covered right then. And um, a, a couple of them that really stood out to me is from the beginning, you always seem to be fairly interested in the data and looking at the data within your schools to decide what to do next. So even though you were in a balanced literacy uh, a framework, you're, you're seeing, look, we're still got these 25% of our students that aren't meeting expectations. So what can we do? And that's a little bit different than some people are like, well, yeah, we're just expecting that to happen and we're okay with that. So I think that's amazing. Um, one question I wanted to ask is where did you start off collecting this data and getting the buy-in from your staff to do so? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So uh, a couple of schools goes, I started off with things like Jerry Johns and those sorts of things that you know, have a bit of a limited application as far as school-wide. And then I, I, I tried, um, what's it called, STAR uh, reading as well. Uh, I got a, a grant to do that, but I wasn't satisfied with, with the information that it was giving and how it was deriving it. So, and it was also ext extraordinarily expensive. There's, there's a big divide between the kinds of money that are available for data professional development in the states as opposed to what we have here in Canada. They have all much so a lot of that stuff's prohibitive. So really the what I was looking for some, for was something that was inexpensive, fairly fast to do and reliable for us in, in, in doing that. And so uh, I kept bumping up against at that time it was called Dibbles or Dibbles Next. But when you first go look at it, you're going, it, it seems so unwieldy it's, yeah, and so on and so forth. And you bump into it and you bump back out of it. 
but uh, as I was doing some reading, and there's people who like it and the people don't. I don't think that the tool is, I mean, it's important to have a good tool, but I, I don't think we need to be overly, overly particular if once you found a good tool. Anyway, make, make a long story short is I, I just uh, saw that they were doing some uh, Dibbles Next um, professional development, trainers, professional development uh, down in uh, just outside of Colorado. So my partner and I, we like to travel in the summer. It's during the summer. So we drove down uh, there and uh, took part in the training. And then all those pieces sort of clicked into place and uh, we're saying, yeah, you know what? It's It was free. And let's use the data management system. It was free to use. And even the data management system at that time was a, was a dollar a child, uh, which was doable by our school. So we took, we were down there for three or four days, got the training on that and also their interventions tools and, and things like that. And we came back up and talk, we talked to staff because we've been trying a whole bunch of different things to staff. And I just said, you know, we're going to give this a try. We're going to give it a try for five years. We're going to see what we get from it. Um, and there's all kinds of lessons learned along the way in, in doing that. Uh, uh, understanding that um, in a number of tools, instruments that are built off of US norms, especially at the early years, are, they're far ahead of our kids. Uh, um, when our kindergarten or grade ones and that we're getting dismal results if we were just looking at the color coding and the results and stuff. So one of the key lessons that we learned through that, and it carried forward to even when we're doing like the Tazrak, Tari, um, and those things, is that understanding what standard scores uh, or percentile markings or whatever that are developed in the states, how they translate to our uh, reality in, uh, in Alberta. Um, and by the time the grades, the kids are in grades four, five, and six, they all sort of line up. But the critical part is at that beginning and, 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 and being able to have a conversation with a teacher where we're not looking at the colors. We're looking at student growth. We're not looking at student achievement. We're looking at student growth. Can we keep moving the needles on these kids? But the other part that I, I did like, um, and Dibble's next, they renamed themselves to Acadians, is that they had a very solid progress monitoring. Uh, tools. They had 20 versions of each of the uh, sub tests that they do um, that were all reliable within each other. And I mean, if you're going to, and so in our interventions, we are, we, when we do progress monitoring, when we're doing our small group interventions, we're testing, we're assessing those kids once a week. So if I have five kids at once every day, they do it. And the, the assessments are doing are only a minute long. Um, and there, we have two reasons for that. And one of them is, well, uh, this is the reason, but we only use in our interventions research proven tools. We don't use teacher created tools and things like that. If we have a child that has a deficit in this area, we have an entire library of intervention tools that we can draw from. So we align those up and then we assess our children at least once a week that are in this because we don't have time to be doing an intervention set that's not working in the kids. If we go three weeks in a row and the child hasn't made the progress we wanted to, we either um, give them more intervention, reduce the class size, or change the intervention entirely, the, the group size for them. Um, and, and that is done uh, very frequently in, in our intervention programs, that kids will move aside, or we might even end up going, like we had a little girl this year that had just had to go one-on-one. -on -one. And then once we did that, um, and focused in particularly on that, she was in a group of three and that was still too big. Uh, we saw some good progress on them. So yeah, so back to the answer. So we used a cadence. Um, it was, uh, we have it, the data management, I do like it. And we don't use it as an accountability for teachers. We use it as a learning conversation for teachers, a growth conversation with teachers. And teachers are, uh, when I first did it, there was a lot of resistance. No, I wouldn't say a lot of resistance. There was resistance to it. But now when, after we do our, our measurements, and we do do our measurements three times a year, beginning, middle, and end of the year, teachers are often coming to me to talk about the data. Uh, they're excited or they have some questions and stuff like that about it. Um, a little bit unfortunate, but our school division has moved to a division wide screening using the three T's, the Tosrek, Tauri, and Tosrek. Uh, and I'm not going to ask my teachers to do two whole systems. Um, and the division didn't pick a case. So this is kind of our last year with it. But we have we have a lot of data. And the, and the learning that we did with the, that system does us well with the systems coming out. We're still going to probably use the cadence. Well, we will use the cadence for our progress monitoring because uh, those uh, tools don't have 
Uh, they say they do, but it's not very good as, and that specific, so. Well, again, there's a couple of great things that you mentioned during that converse or that, that little spiel you gave, but I think one of them that is important to highlight is the difference between the Canadian and the American education systems, especially uh, when we look at kindergarten. So when students are five years old, that is optional. Whereas in the US, we have a lot of kids starting at four years old. And so we have to have different expectations. So we, if we look at those percentiles and standard scores, it's going to be skewed or it's not going to fit our kids because what the norm or the, the kids that these scores were based on are ones that have received more education. So they're going to have higher um, expectations for where the average is going to be at when our kids who haven't had that same early instruction in, in a formal matter, not saying that's a negative thing, just saying that it's different. So looking at the raw score, or if I give them a, 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 a screener and I look at how many questions they answered right, and I don't put that into the conversion to see the percentiles, we're looking to see that gain. And that's what I think you were talking about as that the thermometer, the measuring stick. Yeah. So yeah, we would use, we would strictly be using the standard score as a measure of, of gain, not the raw score, because um, of the way that standard scores are derived out of raw scores. Anyway, and we definitely don't use grade equivalencies, and uh, we don't unless we're holding a conversation with somebody who's not that knowledgeable about statistics uh, and uh, uh, those things. We might use a percentile. Uh, ranking with somebody who it doesn't have an understanding. It's easy to say your child was 56, you know, 56 percentiles. It means, you know, 56. But the problem with percentile rankings is it doesn't tell you the distance between children. Mm -hmm. so, so a 50, a, diff a difference between, ah, it's a little bit like balance literacy levels, right? It doesn't tell you a difference between levels and stuff. Anyway, uh, so we, we uh, as much as possible, use uh, standard scores now. Now, that being said, that's not what's reported in Acadians. Acadians mm -hmm. was a composite score that they derived, but uh, the concepts are, are similar. Again, the important part is that we're looking at the growth. Mm -hmm. um, even if our, you know, you have a child, if you have 85 to 115 as one standard deviation, either way of the mean is at 115, we still want to see growth. And we have an uh, issue if they slip up or going backwards, the same as we would do with a child who might be down at 64, our standard score is 64. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic. About, about five standard scores is a year's growth. So if we, we're moving a kid from 64 to 72, that's fantastic. That's a, that's a lot of good intervention work and we're going to continue on that. So, yeah, so it's uh, it's just a, a way of looking at data that that prom promotes teacher development and and stu and instruction for kids. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not about accountability. It, well, it, uh, it is in a way about accountability. It's about making sure that we don't have instructional deficits in our school that are hurting or that are holding children back. It's about improving the instruction of teachers. Of course. And that was another point that I wanted to highlight is not, look, you mentioned that you don't look at, you know, one professional development option for everybody in no. the school because you understand the individual differences in your staff's knowledge and, you know, what your kindergarten teacher needs to support students at the kindergarten level in even in a, a structured literacy or a science of reading approach is gonna be different than your grade six teachers. And you wanna make sure that the professional development is appropriate for what they're going to be using in the classroom. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I also wanna just um, point out the, the, the other thing I should have mentioned earlier about our screening, particularly in the early years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm. Um, um, adamant that we screen our kindergarten kids. It's it's we do know what uh, typically developing within the, within inside that age range looks like, and um, and typical uh, research shows us that teachers can miss as many as twenty percent of our struggling readers even after having them for a full year. Uh, and I'm sure listeners who have taught 
uh, particularly in grades three and four, you have a child who's gone through who looks like a typically developing reader, and all of a sudden they hit grades three or four and the wheels fall off their wagons because those compensatory strategies that they used to fool their teachers before about being good readers fall off the wagon when, there's, when those things are no longer available in challenging texts and things like that. So that's the other thing that's uh, is, is invaluable for us is, is not letting a child get into school for two, three, four years before we know they're a struggling reader. Yeah, of course. And I mean, that's another feature of selecting an appropriate screener. So you're not just looking at what the student can read uh, in their um, reading. You're also looking at other aspects of it that can identify risk. So I'm assuming in your, you know, your kindergarten screener, you're having some measurement of phonological awareness. Absolutely. There's a lot of phonological awareness. We do a little bit of uh, um, knowing their letter names, but not so much because it's it, it's shown to be a fantastic projector of future reading success. Uh, not that we necessarily at the beginning of kindergarten think they should know their letter names, but it, it's a predictor on that. We wouldn't uh, remediate on that at that level, but absolutely around um, uh, being able to hear manipulative phonemes in spoken word is, is extremely important in the kindergarten. We do test for that. We also have, if a child is, before a child goes into our um, remediation, if they're going to our remediation, we, we do run more um, focused assessments on the child. Uh, one of our favorites at that is our CTOP, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, tells us a lot about where they are in the, in the early stages of reading. Um, and we might even, and if we're using that to identify where we're intervening, and if our interventions past that aren't going, then we start getting more and more deep. Uh, I was just sitting in a, a, a post assessment of a, of a child in, in grade two today because we weren't able to make sense. Of it. And so we had a full scale psychological assessment on her uh, uh, that gave us some information that we were missing. Mm -hmm. Another important thing that you brought up is how the screening's not just for kindergarten. You're oh. looking at the screening across the grade levels to catch kids as soon as you notice that they're falling behind instead of waiting until that grade three and four wall that they hit when those, you know, memorization or cueing or whatever strategies help or can no longer help them. Yeah, that's right. Especially, yeah, um, yeah, the three cueing system is, is uh, I, who, who knows how many struggling readers that that has really harmed uh, throughout them in, in that they it's, it's pulling them away from decoding practices. Um, anything that pulls our kids away from decoding practice. When we're talking about decoding, now cueing in the upper grades, when we're talking about comprehension and things like that, absolutely perfectly acceptable because it's it's one of the strategies that we all use that. But for the earlier, for people who are learning to read and trying to find out, uh, you know, trying to not sign, not signing the word out, but looking for other cues, it's, it's, it's not helpful. Definitely. You also talked about the decodable books mm -hmm. and the breadth that you have. So you're not just focusing on one series and ticking off the box saying, okay, we have, you know, this set of decodable books, we're done. We can, you know, fill another or check another box on the list. You have this vast range of decodable books. Do you mind mentioning some of the series that yeah. you yeah, I don't mind whatsoever. It it goes a little bit with sort of my notion in school, in our school. We don't all have to be using the same program and doing the same thing in schools. Teachers bring different strengths and understandings and that. And if we're all doing the same thing, if we're all on the same page, who's reading the rest of the book kind of thing. So I let teachers a lot of latitude as long and we and the conversation always comes back to student uh, growth. So if there so some of the decodals like we uh we brought in this year Flyleaf uh, is, is one of the ones that we brought in, uh, uh, Spire. So Spire is, a, a Flyleaf and Spire. So Spire is a whole program, but we didn't bring in the whole program, but they have a lot of decodable readers uh, in there as well. Um, what else we, we did, we brought, we just brought in the Hagerty uh, decodables. So those are kind of new for them uh, that came out. Uh, 
there's a bunch of, uh, not a bunch, there are some French immersion ones that we bring in and the name escapes me right now, but it's, but it's a market that's also starting to come out for, not, not for French language, but French immersion, which is fantastic as well. Uh, when we're, they're, they're not as common as the English ones, obviously. Uh, we looked at there. I mean, there's so many companies that do so much. Um, I just recently, now they're not decodable readers, but they sort of have them broken up uh, like um, uh, just, I don't want to say leveled text because well, pe people think I'm still stuck on balance. Literacy. Anyway, they're, uh, you know, easier readers and things like that. They're from, uh, oh, strong nations out of Nanaimo, I think they are, and uh, Good Minds, I think they're out of the Ontario somewhere. So uh, we spent quite a bit. We spent, we just spent about, we had a grant from the government because I couldn't do this without a grant. And we spent about close to $8,000 for grades one and two on books from both those two sites because they really support, we, we have in Alberta, um, Indigenous content is now mandated as well, uh, as, it, as it should be. I mean, it's, a, it's a good thing, I think. Um, and the books we brought in, they look fantastic. You know, we haven't gone depth in them, but uh, our preliminary, preliminary look at them and the samples that we did get were fantastic. So um, a lot of readers. Um, one of the things that we don't do a lot of as my school is we don't use electronic resources in the early grades. Uh, like, I know, like Raz Kids or... Uh, um, head sprouts and, and those sorts of things. It's, uh, we do have the capacity. It's just that we find looking at when we're working with kids, the, the performance of them, their growth is so much better on the, on the, when we keep things concrete, when we, this is a book, I'm holding the book and, and things like this, rather than having them try to understand that what's happening on the screen is real, even though it's not real. It's not a concrete image. It's not something they can touch and, th and stuff like that. So, um, and we're particularly finding that to be the case now that we're turning our uh, profession development towards mathematics for our young kids too. Definitely. Now you did mention that you had purchased a bunch of nonfiction hmm. books. Can yeah. Yeah, so those are the so a lot of the indigenous content they have a lot like a lot of on animals and, and mm -hmm. things that are in there. Uh, this uh, oh, and the mathology. So we're uh, we're trying out mathology in the school. Uh, we well, we've tested it for the last couple of years and we're going to go a little deeper into it for math. But they also have a lot of readers that come with that as well, aimed at certain grade levels, and they have a lot of nonfiction in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And really, our, our, our aim at, at bringing in the nonfiction books is we're, we want to improve children's background knowledge. Uh, we want to improve their vocabulary around that is associated with nonfiction and, and the background knowledge, because we're going to see that play keep multiplying and as they get older uh, into the grades four, five and six being important in their fluency and their comprehension. So it's sort of, there's a reason we do it and, and, and other, I mean, it's also good reading development to match it with what the instruction is, but we're also have an eye on the other aspects of reading development that are important for kids as well. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Now I wanna turn this uh, conversation a little bit back towards you. So when you first started moving from that font to Pinnell, reading recovery, um, programming in your schools, where did you access that learning? Like how did that look for you? Uh, um, like it started with looking at the, the, the data and, uh, um, wanting my wanting better outcomes for the kids, uh, and, and thank goodness for the staff that I was with in that because that's exactly it was a really a, 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 a unique staff. I think there was seven of us in total that I walked into who had a laser focus on in, in this little uh, trailer park community of of getting away from from this pattern of, of low reading of low achievement and stuff like that and, and giving the kids the tools that you need to, as they move forward into the upper grades to be to be on par with kids from other communities that have more advantage than they do um, uh, the staff there is absolutely focused and it was a wonderful environment and culture to be in to do that but 
And so we did what we knew or people told us we'd do. We did the mouse but the, the data, it just wasn't helping our lowest ones. It's, uh, you know, we'd, we'd do all these different things. And so that's kind of where it started. And, and as good as the school was that I was at, it was fantastic. I think I, every time you change a school or you change an assignment, you have an opportunity to do things differently. It, it's easier to do things differently. I, guess, I mean, you can always do things differently, but it's easier. You have new people and stuff like that. You have new understandings. And so when I moved to the next community, it was, uh, that's when it, I started sort of doubling down on trying to find my way through. And again, it started with the data and, and I spent probably more than most people would uh, um, or most people should in finding, in finding a tool that that was useful with inside the culture and the, or the education system I was in. And then once we had that and we understood what was happening with what we were doing, then it started, well, what can we do differently? And really what, ha what happened for me is it was a, it was a multi-tier approach. We needed to address uh, classroom teacher uh, knowledge about our literacy. Uh, so having other systems in place that weren't grounded in research, it becomes enculturated and, you, and it's hard to change that. And so it's bringing this, well, you believe this, but this is actually what's happening or uh, this is what it is and it's not working. So having that, but also what do we do with our lowest performing kids already? And then understanding how can, how can we in, in the school address those lowest performing kids? Sure, we can talk about, you know, tier one instruction, tier two instruction, the pull aside, the centers approach and so on and so forth, but some other th the kids need other things. And I got to tell you, one of the schools that I left, they, they've done a wonderful model where they, for grades one to three, they've taken the kids for an hour every, every day and they put them into likability classrooms. They, they've sort of, because of the data, put them in likability and throughout the years, the kids shift through all of those. So the top level kids where, uh, you know, hopefully most of them are, they're working on, you know, a grade or above specific stuff, but it allows them in the lower grades or in the lower abilities to focus in on those skills. So they're doing like large scale intervention work, um, which is fantastic if you have it. I mean, at that time they had four or five classrooms at each grade level. So it made it a little bit easier to do that. But it's, and it's about finding out what works in your school with the resources you have and what's important. And, and for me, reading is, I was just having a conversation today with somebody that um, when I started school, reading, writing, arithmetic, and getting along were the primary things around elementary. And it's shifting uh, a little bit in that we're, uh, schools are taking on more and more of a social emotional learning, uh, more so than we have in, uh, in other generations and things like that, um, without, without the kind of uh, resources to compensate for taking on that additional thing. So that'll be interesting. My data that I've collected and, and, and talking with other colleagues, not just in this province, other province, also suggests to us that in Canada, we, we might want to start looking at adjusting the norms for our kids coming into kindergarten. And not just before COVID, because the data we're looking at is prior to COVID, we find that our kids are coming in less prepared for school than they were even a decade ago. So their reading, their reading preparedness is, uh, is less than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, that they're not have that for whatever reason, they don't have that phonological awareness and those kinds of things that we hope they would. And so perhaps we need to have a conversation in, our, in an education, A, why is that happening? And B, instead of ratcheting up our expectations for kids, perhaps they should be starting a little bit lower and then bringing them up and having a continuum that way. For sure. Uh, and, you know, there's, when you're talking about this, it's not just the phonological awareness no. and the pre-reading skills. It's also the pre-writing skills when it comes to the fine motor skills uh, that we're seeing. And there's been articles about this for, for years now, how, you know, the moving away from coloring and using Play-Doh and playing with sticks and mud and dirt in the backyard, where you develop those, those muscles just isn't the same anymore. Well, if, if, if there's a budding uh, doctoral student out there, I do have a fantastic notion for a dissertation or something like that. I think that when we, we look at their pre-literacy skills coming in, 
I suspect, and I have not done research in this, so nobody can quote me on this, but I suspect it's because mothers have cell phones and that those child mother interactions are now being blocked by cell phone where, uh, you know, I can see them when they're shopping, they're on their phone, they're not talking to their children or they're right or they're driving around and there's a entertainment system on the back of the seat instead of that conversation happening or they're at the park and the children's, you know, they're doing the catch and release. They're checking to see if they're safe, but mom or dad's staring at a phone. And so they're not developing that, that confidence that they would naturally. So I, 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 I actually think, you know, a lot of people talk about technology, what it's doing uh, when kids are using it. I think th there's also another conversation as technologies are doing it when parents are using it, when children are nearby. And because our first, our first teacher is our mother, you know, mm. it, learning to read starts in utero and mm. uh, they need to continue that. And, and that's just a suspicion I have. I mean, within the last 10 years, uh, cell phone use has exploded. Absolutely. And it, it kind of corresponds with uh, uh, lessening of a children's school readiness, but I think maybe the world's moving on. Maybe I'm not keeping up with it. <laughs> Well, we are in that giant social experiment with this huge emergence of new technology and resources and change in how we do things because of technology. One thing that I want to touch on before we run out of time is your doctoral work and your dissertation mm -hmm. on creating that system wise change what did you look at specifically and what were your findings? Sure. So back in 1986, Schulman had developed a model around teaching that has, without getting right into it, that in which you have to have content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge. So the pedagogical knowledge is how you teach, but the content knowledge is what you teach. And so teachers have a lot of transferable pedagogical knowledge that they can use in in uh, English, social science, whatever it is. But the content knowledge is very specific. And my research has shown that to a very large extent, to almost a frightening extent, teachers are unaware of the content knowledge to do with early literacy teaching. And really, so I thought, well, that, that's absolutely scary. Why is that? But then the research supports that the people who are teaching them, the uh, teacher preparation institutions, the universities, the people who are teaching them don't have a good understanding of, er of early literacy acquisition. And so my, I, my research was now, uh, was how can I get teachers to improve their content knowledge around early literacy? And I, I said, well, they have kindergarten grade one teachers, they have a strength in pedagogy. And so I, I trialed, I developed a system in which teachers would, I would plug them into the Florida Center for Reading or uh, Reading Rockets or something like that, that has good solid base science of reading kind of activities going on. And I, I'd have them take like these lessons or these articles that are super long. And I say, okay, you have to condense that to a five minute lessons that you're gonna give twice a day to your kids. And I mean, to, to be able to condense something, you have to understand it somewhat better than just reading through it once or that. And so what I was hoping to do is, is them using that pedagogical knowledge and then reading through it thinking and improve their content knowledge at the same time. And so they would, they committed, to, I had oh, I don't know, maybe 28 teachers or something like that that go through. And, and uh, if, again, talking to prof future uh, doctoral students, don't do this. Don't, don't try to invent something you knew. You don't have enough time. Just, you know, most people in my class, they describe something. They did surveys. And I, so it's not a, it's, it's never going to win an award that uh, dissertation I did. But what, what I did find is absolutely is that having the linking pedagogy to the content knowledge, I'm also going to, has been absolutely fantastic for the teachers and linking them up and having, and part of that is why, is why in my school now there's that self-directed professional development in, in that teachers become aware of what they don't know. And for, because it's a profession, they're looking to improve that upon themselves. And that kind of practice will, I'm anticipating, well, it already has, I'm not anticipating it's happening around mathematics and other subjects as we move along, so. Well, and that's essential. And especially, I think it's important to recognize that what you need with one year 
might change for the next year because of the makeup of your classroom. Absolutely. And, and also, so yeah, I mean, in, inclusive education is fairly new in, in education. We, in Alberta anyway, we, it's few and far between that we have segregated programs for kids and stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of learning now. I, I mean, the resources to support inclusive education in the province, I don't think has kept pace with the, the need that's in the classrooms, but it does certainly open a door for a need for teachers to be, have a much wider understanding of not just typically developing students, but students to either side to, to a large part of their practice. Yeah. And <laughs> it's very easy to, um, kind of push it aside until it's right in your face. And I think it's important to help facilitate that proactive nature, especially if you're, you know, teaching one of the higher grades and you're aware that you may have this student coming to your classroom, um, you know, doing what you can before they get there as a parent of a child with diverse needs that are uncommon uh, and, and going into classroom meetings or meeting with teachers and principals and having them not know and having me have to explain the issue uh, is, is a frustrating thing because, you know, five minutes on Google can tell you what it is, right? Um, so it, it's putting that impetus on the professional learning ahead of time. And, but, and it also speaks to, uh, Catherine, what I'm hearing is, uh, is the partnership between parents and, and the education system. It, first and foremost, parents need to be advocates for their children, mm -hmm. and, and, and more so with children who have uh, a lot of needs around that advocacy for it. Um, uh, like in our school, we, it's, probably, it's typical everywhere, right? we do like our, our severe kids or our challenging kids, we have IPPs are in place and those are informed and for us they're living documents. So we're not recreate, come September, we don't have teachers creating a brand new IPP. They're building off the one that happened the year before. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those transition meetings are going on right now. Um, and so that we, we have an institutional awareness of a child not just a teacher grade level awareness of them. And so as a child moves through, that just builds and builds in our, in our building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's an excellent resource. Now, what have you found to be the best way to motivate your teachers to take that initiative in creating their own professional development? Yeah, yeah. For, uh, it has been around expectation, around the professional conversations we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're so very fortunate in Alberta and, and, and other provinces are losing this, this um, benefit. But in Alberta, the principals are in the same association as our teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a teacher first. I'm in the same association. And talking to my colleagues in British Columbia and other places where they're separate, the challenges there, I, I can't even imagine. So we recognize I am a principal, I'm, I'm a teacher, but I'm a principal, so I just have a different role. So when we're talking with staff, we're talking as colleagues. We're not talking necessarily as a supervisor to an employee or to mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, and, I, and it just drives me, it, it, it's, it's a little upsetting to see um, provinces and people who have an antiquated, antiquated knowledge of, of um, management in schools and systems like that, uh, taking away the, that, those good working relationships, those professional working relationships. So when you ask me what is what, what has got the teachers, it's around those conversations for how their kids are doing and that and the understanding that we're professionals. We're, we're, we're not just, you know, Joe Schmuck who comes off the street and works with kids. We have a unique uh, body of knowledge. We have a unique way to do it. And we're working for our futures and the kids' futures. And so when we look at data and we can do better, we're obligated to do so. Definitely. And have you implemented a way for peer learning between the teachers? Say if one of your teachers has a strength in an area that another needs support. That's it. Yeah, so um, COVID, it was a little tough. We had a tough slug on, on, on that only because it, people were isolated and that. But I know already with COVID lifting, as a matter of fact, we just got an email today. So all our measures are done. COVID's over. 
yay, we made it. Um, that I already have uh, teachers who are going, getting back into each other's classrooms, looking at how they're doing, sharing kids back and forth and stuff like that. And, and really, I think that uh, the credit goes to the, my staff and my school that have developed or ha that we have this culture mm -hmm. that uh, of sharing of, of interconnect, interconnectedness and that, and that yes, a homeroom teacher has these kind of responsibilities, but we ha also have all these other opportunities and things to assist in, in, in that process of educating all the kids in the classroom. Yeah. And it, I think it's really important to understand the knowledge within your school and how you can use that to better everybody's practice, as well as not necessarily being so strict on this classroom, that classroom. Uh, yeah. Because I, I've seen team teaching work fantastically. Yeah. And, th and that's not to say, you know, I do have, I do have teachers who prefer, you know, they're focused on their own thing and they're doing a great job at it. Mm -hmm. But I also have the, and that, and I'm okay with all those. I, um, well, Rick DeFore, he had, uh, what was it called? Uh, where they force teachers to get together. Uh, I forget the name of it, but anyway, I mean that there's so much managerial work in supporting that and, and, and contriving that kind of things. And I, Again, I get back to it's our own development expectation around professionalism and what we're doing and at getting better at what we're doing. And lots of teachers will see working with a partner, can, uh, you know, having a partner, having a small team gets them better and they're going to do that. And other teachers might be a part in the career where they're just hunkering down. I've got to improve this and they're going to do that. So uh, I don't need to have all my teachers on the same page doing the same thing, but I do need to have them aware of how their teachers affecting kids and showing improvement, student growth. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I'm looking forward to our next one where we're looking more at what's happening in your school and some of those tools that you were talking about as far as the interventions go right. that were research-based instead of teacher-based. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure.